there was this avalanche of questions that came in. And so I walked into the office yesterday and I had planned on following up on all the questions and jumping into the science of habits, which are the topics for the next two episodes on the podcast. We've been researching it like crazy. I was going to talk all about how you break habits, how you make habits. And I sat down and I mean, we've been researching this for weeks and I've been teaching this topic of the science of habits for years and years and years. I write about it, but I got behind the mic and I just froze. I felt this wave of emotion hit me. It was this like really, oh my God, this like uncomfortable feeling rise up and my mind went blank. And when I tell you, I know the science of habits like the back of my hand, I mean, I could talk your ear off at a dinner party about the science of habits and cite all the studies and explain all the steps. And here I was yesterday behind the mic and my mind went blank. And I just felt off, something was off. And I even started to cry, and I know why. I had a really lousy ending to 2022, and it came out of nowhere. I had been working for a long time on all of these incredible plans uh, that were going to happen the first week of January, and just everything went completely sideways. And so now it's the beginning of the year, and it doesn't feel exciting, and it doesn't feel like I've got a clean slate. Honestly, it feels like piles of shit all over the place. And if you want to know the formula for feeling unhappy, here's what it is. Your expectations for how things should be right now don't match the reality of how things are. I don't know if anybody else is feeling this way right now. It doesn't feel like the normal, woohoo, it's a new year. And look, I know all about what researchers call the fresh start effect, how you get this clean slate the moment that the clock strikes midnight on January 1st or the moment you close your eyes and you blow out the birthday candles. But the fact is, I'm not feeling the fresh effect right now. I'm feeling the, I feel kind of fucked effect right now. That's how I'm feeling. And it may strike you as odd to hear that, you know, somebody as inspiring and motivational as Mel Robbins is going to say, I could honestly give a shit about the new year, new you at this moment, because I've got piles of shit surrounding me that I need to shovel and clean up from last year. And I honestly thought I was fine. I thought that, okay, all this stuff had happened. I'd push it in the rearview mirror. I'm starting January 1, clean slate. I also committed to doing this crazy challenge called 75 Hard with my husband and our daughter and her boyfriend and my brother and a bunch of other amazing people. And for the last three days, I've had my head down and I've been plugging away at it. And what is 75 Hard? Because I know you're thinking it means you're not going to drink for 75 days. That's going to be kind of hard for me. It's not like I drink every day, but I have not gone 75 days without drinking since I was 16 years old. Uh, You also have to uh, drink a gallon of water every day, which is not the easiest thing to do when you've had bladder surgery. You also have to exercise twice a day. Um, No gluten. No gluten for 75 days. I haven't gone five days without gluten. And so I've taken this challenge on and I've been really excited about it. And I thought, okay, Mel, you're moving, you're grooving, you've got these goals, you're taking the steps to achieve them, you're feeling excited, you've got your why, you've got your your will, your way, your how, all the stuff we talked about in the last episode. And then boom, I woke up yesterday morning and I got triggered. That's what happened. And I bet you're also not feeling the new year, new you thing either. No one in my house is feeling it this year. I don't know if it's the crappy weather here in Southern Vermont where it's been raining instead of snowing. I don't know if it's just that it's been kind of a hard couple years. I don't know what the hell is going on. All I know is I had my head down and I was plugging away and I was really proud of myself. I'm in day four of 75 hard and I am kicking ass and taking names. And I woke up this morning and you will not believe what triggered me. Do you want to take a guess? What sent me spiraling? My holiday cards. (laughs) I woke up this morning 
and the alarm goes off. And my alarm is one of those alarms that mimics the sunrise. So the sun is rising in my room. And I even have a bird sound now that I know the research that we covered a couple episodes ago. And so the birds are chirping. And the first thing that I saw on my nightside stand was a stack of 200 holiday cards. Now, I should be proud of myself because it's been three years since our family has been able to agree on a photo and upload it to a website and get the holiday cards printed in time to mail them out. Three years. So you would think seeing this stack of holiday cards would make me feel proud. No. I saw them. They're still wrapped in plastic wrap. I have not even opened them up. And I see them and I'm like, what the hell, Mel? You have had those things sitting there since the beginning of December. And you can't seem to get your shit together to get them in the mail? Come on, woman. How the heck can you possibly get behind a microphone and teach people about the power of habits and the science of habits when you can't even follow through on the freaking Christmas cards that are sitting on your, on your desk? And there, that was my trigger right there. The wave of the emotion went flying through my body and I had an experience that you will have when you try to change anything in your life, when you try to become healthier, when you try to become more organized, when you're playing a bigger game, when you're trying to learn new habits, when you set big goals, at some point, it's going to become too much. Some little piddly weird ass thing like your Christmas cards is going to send you spiraling and you're going to have something that I call the fuck it moment. That little thing triggers a wave of uncomfortable emotion and you say, fuck it. Happy fucking new year. I'm not doing it this year. And let me tell you, one small fuck it moment like that can spiral into a big ass fuck it moment. Because I first saw those cars and I'm like, fuck it. I am never going to get my shit together. And then I go into the bathroom. And I'm like, oh my God, my ADHD medication, it is completely out. I, 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 I just let the prescription run dry. How the, how the hell am I going to get through this day? Fuck it. And then I'm like, well, I know what I could do. I could throw those cards in the trash can. Fuck it. I'm not doing it. There's no way, by the way, that I can talk about habits when my house right now literally looks like the Thanksgiving Day Macy's Parade just marched right through it. I don't know if it's because all three kids have been home for two weeks. I mean, it's been amazing to have them home, but there are dust balls in every corner. There are hairballs from the dogs. There are wet towels. There's a sock here or there. There's a shoe that's I, like, I don't even know where to begin. I don't know where to begin. How could I possibly talk about the science of habits to you? When my house looks like this, my Christmas cards are not mailed. And I feel like I am surrounded by a ton of shit that I still need to deal with from last year. Yesterday. Two days ago, change seems easy. Two days ago, I'm like, huh, 75 hard? This is 75 easy for me. And then I woke up and I'm like, I, I can't do this. And it's going to happen to you. And I felt an obligation to talk about this because we're doing this series all month long. I mean, this show is about creating a better life. And part of creating a better life is having moments that you're going to have to navigate where you get triggered by something stupid or something profound and all these emotions come up and you say, fuck it. And I do not want you to give up in those moments. I do not want you to throw in the towel or throw out the Christmas cards or say, I can't do it. I mean, that's what I did yesterday. I felt that huge wave. I said, that's it. Fuck it. I came up into the office and I started crying and I said to the team, I can't do this. I can't talk about habits. I can't, I can't even get Christmas cards out in the mail. I can't do this. I went to my husband and my daughter and I said, I'm not doing 75 hard. I got too much going on. I, this is not the time for me to do this. Like I'm setting myself for, for failure. And you know what they said? They said, yes, you can. Yes, you can. And they sat there and they listened to me whine and whine and whine. And Chris looked at me and he said, Mel, you got to have a breakthrough. You have to take on something that feels hard and you have to do it for longer than the month or the, you know, 45 days that you've done it in the past. 
And right now is the perfect time. The fact that you're feeling the fuck it just four days in, this is a good thing, Mel, because it's pushing buttons in you. And so what was interesting, because it's pushing buttons in you, and you know what? He's right. He's absolutely right. And so I went to bed, like immediately. I didn't even want to tempt myself because I was so frazzled. I, I went to bed. I slept all night. And when I woke up this morning and came up to work, what was so interesting is that life doesn't always give you what you want, but it does give you what you need. And I think fuck it moments sometimes are what you need because you need to see that you can have a moment where you want to give up and you can even screw up in those moments. And you can get back on the transformation train and you can keep going. That you are bigger than the fuck it moment. That the fuck it moment is there to test you. It's there because it's part of the process of growing. It is there because you got to learn how to manage these emotions that are going to come up. And sure enough, when I came up here this morning going, okay, everybody, I can do the science of habits because I did my workout this morning for 75 hard and I've had my half a gallon of water and I've read my 10 pages of fiction and I'm halfway there and I'm back on the horse. My team said, you know what, Mel, hold up a second on the science of habits because there's a question that came in from one of the listeners on the podcast that might just interest you. It's a question from Liza. And sure enough, this question does interest me because guess what? Liza, she was having a fuck it moment too. Check this out. My question is, I've been doing really well with a habit and I just broke down a couple nights ago. It was the end of the day. I had these uncomfortable feelings. I don't know where they were coming from. So what do you do when you're burned out and you know the right thing to do, and you can't do it. Boy, can I relate to that. And I know you can too. And that's why we're going to talk about those fuck it moments today. And even better, after a short word from our sponsors, we're going to have Liza here. And we're going to dig in and find out what's actually going on. Welcome back. We're talking about that moment when you're chipping away at change in your life, and all of a sudden something happens, and you're like, that's it throwing in the towel. I'm out. That's exactly what happened to me yesterday. It's what happened to Liza. And so I'm excited because Liza's here. Liza, welcome to the show. And I'd love to start by having you ask the question that you sent to me again. My question is, I've been doing really well with a habit and I just broke down a couple nights ago was the end of the day. I had these uncomfortable feelings. I don't know where they were coming from. So what do you do when you're burned out and you know the right thing to do and you can't do it? So tell me specifically the habit that it's drinking. It's drinking. Okay. Yeah. So do you have a problem with drinking or do you just not want to drink because it's poison and it's impacting how you sleep and it's a good thing not to do? It's probably a little bit of everything. Okay. Um, it's the time has come for me to just give it up and get on with my life. Okay. Um, and how long were you able to not have a drink? Uh, 300 odd days. That's a big deal. Yeah. So I don't know where this whole thing came from. I think you do. So let's talk about what triggered you to reach for whatever it was? What did you make? I had uh, some champagne. Okay. I had bought some champagne for my husband for his birthday. Okay. Walk me through that moment when you basically were like, fuck it. Um, Sunday night, we had gone to a parade. We had seen some friends, but I knew that there was another group that I wanted to go be with. And then when we went to the next party, everybody was drinking. And for some reason, I just really wanted to drink. 
Okay. And I, I also was like munching on all of the good munchies. And I've been such a healthy eater that I felt guilty about my munching. I was just very frustrated. So was it frustration that caused you to drink? And the reason why I'm digging is because I want to figure out what instance, what emotion specifically triggered you. And what I wonder is the folks that were at the second party, are they aware that you're no longer drinking? We didn't discuss it. Do you feel shame about the fact that you don't drink? No, I think it was more, I felt like I was missing out. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wanted to relax. Okay. Well, I can relate to the wanting to relax part. It's kind of weird because we had had somebody at church who had fainted while she was reading early, you know, at the beginning of the day. And that really threw me off. And then I probably had a fear of being alone, you know, because she was, she was alone in town. And so I thought, well, what if when my husband dies and I'm living somewhere alone, what would I do? Maybe that was it. Do not make yourself wrong. Because I guarantee you, you've been beating yourself up about this. Is that right? Yeah, sure. But what have you been saying to yourself about it? What am I going to do when it really gets hard? And how does that make you feel? It feels like I've lost any kind of progress that I've made. So. And I want to be a health coach. So I, you know, I don't want to be speaking out of both sides of my mouth. Well, you shouldn't be if you're coaching people. Yeah. And this is a very important breakdown for you because in truly digging deeper as to what was triggering you and unpacking it for yourself, you're going to be able to help a lot more people because most addictions, most unhealthy habits are triggered by really uncomfortable feelings and negative emotional states and our inability to tolerate it. And what I want you to get to the bottom of is what was that core feeling? And maybe it was sadness or a lack of control. Maybe it was something that is really scary for you to feel. And so the alcohol becomes a fuck it, a way to numb it, a way to pretend it's not there. And what I want you to understand is that there are going to be moments that are way more scary and confronting than being at that party. But if you can choose not to drink for 300 days because you know it doesn't serve you, you can choose not to drink in moments that are wildly confronting. And you have not lost progress at all. All of the hard work that you've done for more than 300 days in a row are still in your neural pathways. It's still in your nervous system. And beating yourself up is going to make you feel disempowered. It's going to make you feel unmotivated to continue to do the work to stay sober and to make the choice that actually empowers you. One of the things that I believe that you need to come up with is mechanisms to coach yourself through those moments. And those mechanisms can be anything from, oh, when you notice the feelings coming up, naming the feelings. Do I actually want to drink or do I just feel uncomfortable right now? Simply asking yourself that question when you feel triggered is a way to become more conscious of what's driving you. The second thing that you should always do, no matter what, is always have some alternative beverage that you're excited about. 
make sure that you've got a non-alcoholic wine or you've got a kombucha or you've got one of the like number of non-alcoholic spirits that are out there or non-alcoholic beers so that you can raise your wine glass so you can feel included without needing to break the promise that you have with yourself. Well, I was able to get through the whole party. It's when I got home. Oh, now that's interesting. So what yeah. happened when you got home? That's when I went in the fridge and I found the champagne and I went up and watched a Lifetime movie or drank my champagne. And so when you got home, what were you feeling? I'm, I, I was like, what is wrong with me? Why do I feel so weird? It was like I was looking at myself and not knowing what to do next. Where was you your know, husband? Being, we have to learn how to be uncomfortable with being, or be comfortable with being uncomfortable is what they say. Well, it's, do you believe that? No, that's what somebody said. Correct. You have to learn how to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Do you believe that? I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> no. Okay. But what I'm asking you is, do you actually want to learn how to do that? Yes. Okay. And- Tell me why you stopped drinking. Because it was a, a habit that I was dealing with just about every day. You're not going to like what I'm about to say. I think you need to go to 90 meetings in 90 days and truly get to the bottom of why you no longer want to drink and the role that alcohol played in helping you avoid uncomfortable feelings. Because if you were to go to 90 meetings in 90 days and just sit and listen, it would be very uncomfortable. And I think it would also provide a level of support that you need in order to have a profound breakthrough. And I also believe that this is happening for a reason. It's happening because you've done so much work on yourself, and this is now requiring you to level up. You want to go make a huge difference with people, and you want to coach people in being able to form better habits. If you put on the, I'm a student, of truly understanding how to live in discomfort, and I'm going to put myself in a situation that I don't want to go to because I can tell you don't want to do this, do you? No. But I wouldn't mind having a breakthrough. I think this is a bigger deal than you're saying it is. And it's just because of the casual nature of the way that you're talking to me about it. And I want you to have a huge breakthrough in this. And I believe you told me this because you knew I wouldn't pussyfoot around with it. Thank you for that. You're welcome. And your clients are going to need that from you. And that's why you need it from me. You know, you've been on this incredible mm -hmm. journey of healing. What has it taught you about greatness? You can't be great without having peace and without going on a healing journey, in my mind. You can accomplish a lot. You can achieve a lot. You can get a lot of awards and make a lot of money. But I feel like if you feel like you don't are still aren't enough, then you're not great, I don't think. Because really the think enough, so. the thing that you're chasing is outside of you. It is outside of you. And again, I was chasing them to feel better about myself, to feel like, okay, I matter and I have value because I didn't believe I had value. And I think um, once you believe you have value, then you're creating from a space of love and win-win and service as opposed to, I need to do this for me and look good and fill something up inside of me. You're doing it from a more healing journey uh, place and then you're able to give more. You're able to create in a better place. So a lot of my life was doing things to prove people wrong mm. that I felt abused, abandoned, made fun of by. 
It's like, well, let me go make, create, succeed to prove people wrong. Mm. So when I would lose, I was a bad loser because I was like, oh, I didn't prove them wrong. I lost. They were right. And so it was just a different energy of creation. It's the second most powerful fuel is the fuel of anger and not enoughness. Right. You can go nonstop for years trying to prove your enoughness from that state. But it is exhausting energy. It's draining. It's like you feel like, oh, what was the point of this? So many times I accomplish things in sports, biggest dreams after 10 and 15 years of thinking about them, working hard and accomplishing it and feeling like so angry after I accomplished it because I thought I would feel something different. Mm. And I still didn't feel good enough. So I was like, I need to go create more and accomplish more. And then I would do it. And I was like, why am I still feeling alone inside? It's because I didn't have a good relationship with me internally. And once I started to shift that, I just feel such a good sense of peace. And because I have a meaningful mission that is not about me, it's about others as well. And you so talk when, about mission in this book. And I a think lot. that's the foundation. It's like getting clear on a meaningful mission that How it's not about. How do you do about, that? Uh, I mean, it's I mean, a, you've got you've got the framework in here, yeah, but but I'm, I'm trying. I'm thinking, Lewis, about the person. It depends on the season of your life. And again, if you are trying to pay your bills, you can't think about a meaningful mission. You got to think about protecting yourself, safety, and getting to a place of well, that's financial a meaningful stability. mission, right? And that is a meaningful mission for this season, right? Okay. So when I was on my sister's couch, that's all I could think about was like, how can I make enough money to get off the couch? Great. And so that was the mission for that season. But once you complete that, you got to think about something bigger that includes others, right? And so I was still including others in that by adding value to people in order to get money from them, right? Essentially, I'm going to give you a service, I'm going to help you, and you're going to pay me. Right. So I'm helping them overcome a problem. And I was using my, my passion and my power to solve a problem. And that's what I started to do. And then I started to, once I, once I overcame that mission or accomplished it, I was like, okay, now I can see a little bit further. Now what do I want to create? And the same thing happened with the School of Greatness. Once now, so they, hold on. I just yeah. want for, to tell everybody. So Lewis basically, in looking for a job, figured out how LinkedIn worked. Exactly. And then realized, oh, whoa, I can teach other people uh -huh. how to use LinkedIn like a pro. And so he literally became wildly successful being an expert on monetizing on and utilizing yeah. LinkedIn and one platform. And tell everybody how you came up with the School for Greatness idea. So after, I don't know, four or five years of, of kind of teaching LinkedIn and then expanding it into just social media and marketing in general and courses and stuff like that, I realized, okay, I had enough money for maybe two years to live. Oh, that's and, pretty damn good, Lewis. But when you're broke and poor, uh, at that least from my like point of view. the I, holy grail. When you're broke and poor, from my point of view, I didn't spend anything. I was like, I just need to stack everything because yep. I was in scarcity mode. Yep. So I wasn't like spending anything. So I had enough. And I also didn't have a car. You know, I was living in like an apartment that was only $495 a month. I was like living in the, the lowest amount I could. I was like taking trains places, not like flying anywhere. I was like, how can I this save? This is Lewis the Squirrel. Yes, yes I was a squirrel his nuts, trying man. to get Here nuts we go. everywhere. That's put right. Him in, <laughs> put him in my back pocket. And um, and once I realized, oh, I can actually like, I'm surviving now, right? I'm, I'm thriving. I'm surviving. I got out of this kind of like scarcity mentality. Yeah. I was able to think beyond that. I was able to think beyond this like need to like just make money really quickly. And... Um, I realized I didn't want this anymore. This season of life, I was like, I don't want to do what I was doing in this business anymore. So I sold it to a business partner that I had. And I was like, okay, I've got about two years of cash if I don't make any money to survive. Yep. This is the exact moment when I got into the fight in the basketball court. I was going through a breakup in a relationship that I moved to LA for. And uh, I was just having breakdowns in life. And so I was literally stuck in traffic in LA a little over 10 years ago. Tuesday next week is my 10 year anniversary for my podcast. No way. Tuesday next week. So a little over 10 years ago, maybe 10 years and three months ago, I'm stuck in LA traffic. All this stuff had just happened. And I'm just thinking to myself, man, I've, I don't have it all figured out. I thought I did. I thought my ego knew it was right. Yeah. I thought I, you know, accomplished stuff and this and that and was featured in the White House and all these other things. I was like, man, I should be the man, but I feel like a loser. And I was stuck in LA traffic. We were literally on the 405. And um, 
we were not moving. And all these people around me in cars stopped, were screaming and honking and flipping each other off. <laughs> and I'm honking and I'm like, man, I'm stuck. We're stuck. Everyone's stuck. And I was just like, okay, huh. If people are stuck in traffic and they're taking them so long to get places, what if I could offer value and solve a problem for them to get unstuck? This was literally what I was going through. And I was like, I need the solution myself. And I just started hearing about, hearing about podcasting. This was um, 2012. Like, I just started to hear like just whispers, you know, whisper, podcasting, what is this thing, right? And I was like, I literally called two friends in the car. It was a long drive being stuck i called two friends i go i know you have a podcast i just saw you launch Who this were thing. They? pat flynn and my friend Derek halpern okay called them both and uh i go tell me about the podcasting thing and they're like i love it it's the coolest thing ever the audience i'm connecting the building the relationship it's the best thing ever i don't make any money but it's the best <laughs> thing ever and i was like okay cool and i was like man i think i could do this because i had started to just interview people for myself, mm. recording it for me, like business leaders and sports athletes and all these people for years leading up to that. That's how I got in kind of the LinkedIn space. I would network with people, I'd interview them. And I just was like, man, I've learned so much from these people which got me here in my business results. So let me take it a step farther. And they were both telling me like, well, you should just make it about like marketing and entrepreneurship because that's what you're doing. Right. I was like, ah, it just doesn't resonate with me. I feel like I'm supposed to do something more. They're like, well, don't go too broad because it probably won't work. Oh, you mean like greatness? Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> and who are you? You're still just like getting started. You're like an internet marketer. You don't have a big audience. Like you can't go too broad. You just beat somebody up on a basketball court. I know, right. I mean, like you're, you're breaking down everywhere in your life. Yeah. And I was just like, again, that voice kept saying like, I just feel like this is what I want to step into though. Mm. And even if it fails, I'm going to make it an experiment. I'm going to do it for one year, one episode a week for a year and just see if I like it. So I discovered the mission by exploring something, by being curious and trying it. And I gave myself some parameters. I'm not going to try to make money. Again, at that time, I had money for two years. Got it. So some people may not have that luxury right. when they're figuring this out in terms of making money. You might have to make money really quickly. If I needed to make money, I could have. Well, you also don't have to go all in. Exactly. What I loved about what you said, did, I, did you hear what Lewis said? Experiment. He gave himself permission to experiment with something for a year. Number two, he took the pressure off and said, I'm not going to make this experiment generate money. Mm -hmm. And so if you can, whether you're on the couch or you're working a job, if you can give yourself the grace of an experiment mm -hmm. and take the pressure off of money, yeah. you now are walking in the footsteps of greatness here. Mm -hmm. And so you set out on this experiment. And you didn't yeah. know shit about how to do it. I you have no two clue. friends that... I had an iPhone that I used to record in the beginning. I had no clue what I was doing. I was, you know, I was trying to do what I thought I was supposed to do. I was just like trying stuff. And my, it's funny because my assistant listened to the first episode like last week. She goes, I went back and listened to the first episode. She goes, you're a completely different person. And I'm like, because it was more about success, mm -hmm. right? It was more about like achievement and winning and like results. Oh, I have to go back and listen now. It's like, you, Lou. So we're right. gonna have to pop in a little right. audio of Lewis the, introducing. Exactly. <laughs> then after, then I went to this workshop a few months later. Oh, the I one where you opened spoke up for about, the first time, yeah, about sexual abuse and all these things. And I actually, this is so funny. I actually learned the concept about no one wins. Or you don't win unless everyone wins around you. You know, that was like what that concept didn't make sense to me as an athlete. I was like, no, there was one winner. <laughs> Everyone else must lose. Otherwise, you're the loser, right? That was kind of like the mentality that was, I was trained with. Right. It was the programming that I was conditioned to have. And this workshop taught me that you don't win unless everyone wins. You embody that, dude. And it, and it is about, and it, thank you. And it's about, it doesn't mean, you know, winning could look differently for everyone around you, but there must be like a win-win experience. Otherwise, your win doesn't mean as much if, if others aren't improving and growing and succeeding in whatever it is they're doing as well, right? It doesn't mean it has to be equal winning or something like that. And that's why I was like, yeah, that's right. This, this podcast can't be about like results. It should be about elevating others and about improvement and how we can all win together. Hmm. And that's when it started to shift. And I started to like be a little softer and be less like, let's just get results, you know? And, um, 
and it was beautiful. So there, there's so much that happened in that first year of the experiment where I started to like try something and it, and it wasn't perfect the first hundred times. I, I just said, how can I make it better every time? How can I listen to the feedback and make it better every time? And, um, and how can I find my voice in this process? You know, even if I'm not comfortable sharing my voice, how do I find it by practicing it? Mm. And after the first year, I remember um, being like, man, I just really loved this and enjoyed it. And so 10 years later, here we are. I still love it, still enjoy wow. it. Wow. When you think back on literally probably thousands of people that you've interviewed, mm -hmm. what's one interview that you reflect on the most? I was going to say Kobe because he was my favorite interview. But when you said this, um, there was an interview the first year that I had with a guy named Chris Lee, who is the actual coach and trainer of the workshop I went to when I opened up for the first time. Really? He had such a massive impact on me from that experience that I ended up hiring him as a coach for a couple of years just to like coach me personally. Mm. And I had him come on the show and I had him put me through... Well, I guess he put me through it, but I asked him about like, I was single at the time. I go, how do you find the dream like partner? And he put me through a guided meditation where he had me close my eyes. And he like walked me through a scenario and a scene of my future self. He said, I want you to imagine waking up next to this person. I want you to imagine what they look like, what they sound like. I want you to imagine what you, when you open the windows where you are in the world, what your view is. I want you to imagine the feeling, the experience you're having with this person. And um, the reason I'm talking about that is because I said to myself during that, my eyes were closed, I was like, <laughs> I don't know if this was weird or not, but I was like, I wake up next to the woman of my dreams and when I open my eyes, she looks at me and she's smiling at me every morning. And I remember saying that. I don't know why that came to me, but I was like, she, she looks at me, she's smiling at me because she's so grateful and happy that we're in this relationship together. And essentially eight years later, I'm in a relationship with a person that wakes up, that literally opens her eyes and looks at me and smiles. And this is no joke. It happens every day. She looks at me, she hugs me. Some days she wakes up crying, I'm not kidding because she's just a grateful human being, not just because of like, I'm in her life, but she's just a happy person. And I dreamt of this. And so for me, that was a powerful, powerful episode because I had two other relationships before her and after this conversation. Those, those things didn't happen. And I realized that it only happened the moment I started to fully heal a lot of the emotional things that I still wasn't ready to face in intimacy. Mm. So I healed one element, but not all the other elements. And it wasn't until I, I, literally there was a pain in my chest for still for years from other things, not the sexual abuse pain, because I could talk about that freely and be right. at peace. But in other things that I still wasn't willing to face, and it wasn't until I faced those things two years ago, there was a pain in my chest for many years that would come and go, it disintegrated after about five months of intensive therapy, integration, healing. It finally disintegrated in my chest and I felt this ball of pain go throughout my body into like complete freedom. And it hasn't come back since. Wow. It took five months of intense reflection, exercises, practicing of healing the nervous system mm -hmm. to where that went away. Mm -hmm. That is literally a month or two later, I met her. Wow. And it's been a game changer ever since. Have you talked publicly about what that thing was that you faced? I just started, I haven't really talked about it publicly. I just started kind of telling people that, because I don't know if other people feel a pain in their chest. I don't know if, if you've ever felt like a ball that's kind of like this, not palpitations, but just kind of a nagging pain. I think people feel the, I feel it more kind of like right above the stomach. Yeah. That's sort of where my... And I know when it's coming because it hits the ankles first and then this clinches. Yep. Like wobbly legs or something? No, no. like I feel literally, the when I get triggered, I literally feel it start. And it comes to your stomach. Yeah, but I think you want to know why. It's because that's how the person approached oh, me. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah, I because it was used to be the throat and the chest for me. Mm -hmm. You just feel like I couldn't speak. Yeah. And there was like a pain here. And I was just like, it wasn't like I felt like I was having a heart attack or anything like that, but it's just like a nagging pain. Yeah. 
it would come and go and I couldn't figure out how to get rid of it or how to like eliminate it. And it just, I went to five months of intensive every week therapy, sometimes five, six hours on Saturdays where I was just like, I'm a maniac on a mission to create peace, clarity, and freedom. The first day I stepped into therapy with the, my coach, I call her an emotional coach because I think we should all have one. She said, what's your intention for starting this process? I said, I want peace, clarity, and freedom because hmm. I didn't feel like I had e any of those. Can I take a guess at what your biggest block was? Sure. It was an inability to even allow love in. Is that what it was? I don't know if that's what it was. Maybe, but it was my inability to not abandon myself. What does that mean for somebody who's never heard that term? So it was my inability to, to not abandon myself in intimacy with one person, the person that I was choosing to be in a committed relationship with. Because I wanted to abandon myself in other areas. Mm. I would stand up for, I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. Oh, for you like a nice guy doormat type in relationships? I was more trying to buy peace. So whenever my relationship, what uh, oh. relationships in the past would try to, it would be upset at me. Yeah. You didn't do this. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll go do it now. Yeah. Whenever there was disturbance emotionally. Yes. You or the through? environment, or they were screaming at me, or they were cold shoulder, or they wouldn't speak to me. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't like this feeling. And so I didn't know how to navigate my inner world when that would happen. I didn't know how to be peaceful under chaos emotionally. So I would do things to buy peace. I would say, okay, I'll stop doing this. Even though I don't want to stop doing something, yeah. I'll stop doing it to make you feel comfortable. Yeah. Okay, I'll give in here. Okay, I'll, I'll come home five hours early. Okay, I won't go on that trip because you don't feel comfortable with me going alone. See, I don't think people understand how much men struggle with this. That, that no, I, I mean it. Like, you're, you, this is why I said you remind me a tremendous amount in mm. ways of Chris. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Like, just would shut down. Yeah. And Or give in. Or, or whatever, give in yeah. and not capable of expressing what he needed because his experience as a kid was it didn't matter anyway. Exactly. And a lot a lot of times, you know, in general, a lot of men were never trained on how to navigate uncomfortable emotions through their highest selves. They would navigate it through their ego self, which is to defend, protect, and show that everything's okay. And that works in some cases, but not in every case. And I think I didn't have the tools, the training, the knowledge, the experience, the wisdom on how to navigate stressful emotions in love, in an intimate, loving relationship. Mm. I could do it in business and sports and what other things. What was it modeled for you? It wasn't modeled for little. me. Yeah, it was constant. It was a constant low level stress and like resentment from my parents of each other, which yeah. made me always like, ah, what's going to happen, right? And they loved me and I, and I knew they loved me, but it was, I knew they also didn't love each other. Yeah. And so that was stressful. Um, and so I didn't know how to how to be with a woman who was like, you can't do this, <laughs> screaming at me, don't do this. I don't like when you do this. This is not okay, blah, 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 blah. Because what they are saying is you're not enough. And I don't accept you for who you are, Lewis. Mm. So I didn't accept myself for who I was. I, I, knew, I knew I wasn't enough. That's how I thought. So I said, I'm going to do what's going to make her feel like I'm enough for her. Right. And after a year, two years, three years of doing that and just giving in and giving in and giving in, you fully lose yourself. Yes. You lose all your, you, you lose who you are. And then you get resentful, you get frustrated, you get angry. So I lacked the emotional ability to say no. And if you don't love me and accept me and you want to walk away, that's okay. And I lacked the emotional ability to, um, to just be okay with me walking away from something as well. And that's why when I met Martha, uh, which you've met her oh, a couple she, of times now. She smiles at you all the time. I had a, I had a, a fully different experience. Because, because you were different. Because I was completely different. And, and I just told her like straight up, I was like, this is my values, this is who I am, and I'm never gonna abandon myself for anyone. Mm -hmm. You, this, that, it doesn't matter. Like, I'm just never going to abandon myself. You know, it doesn't mean I'm not going to be a flexible human being and supportive in all these other ways, but I'm not going to give up who I am to please one human being because they're not happy with me. Dude, if you could sum up the greatness mindset, I think you just did. There is this quote that goes viral all the time. I have no idea who said it first, 
but it's that thing that when you uh, put all your energy into trying to keep the peace with others, you create a war oh, inside yourself. That's and good. that is just what you described. Yeah. That tension in your chest, and so many of you listening listen with it, or that pit in your stomach is the war mm -hmm. that Lewis just described with yourself because you're so much more focused and concerned with keeping the peace, making sure everybody else is okay. And until you invert that mm -hmm. and you focus on creating peace within yourself, that's it right there. And this is the moment when it unlocked, I remember now, exactly what happens when this the pain went away. Because I was working on, because I didn't feel free, right? And so for five months of therapy going in every week, I was committed. I was like, I'm going to figure this out. And I'll go as long as it takes. Um, You're like a truffle pig for healing. I was like, He's going to root yeah, that yeah. thing out exactly. right there. I'm doing it, man. I'm and not going to stop until I am healed. I, I love that. I'm I remember, proud of you. And, I'm, and healing is a journey. It's not an event that happens overnight. Right. There's an unlocking. There's an awareness moments. But then you've got to, then PTSD occurs if you don't keep integrating it. Yeah. So. It's a constant. So journey. what was that moment? So the moment was many because every time I would meet my coach, she'd say, What's your intention? Peace, clarity, freedom. Okay. I didn't feel them. And so we were talking about what each one is. When do you not feel peace? When do you not feel clear? Freedom. And I was like, I've never felt free in my life. And a lot of it came down to modeling parents. They weren't free in their relationship. Mm. They both were resentful of being in the relationship. They both got married when they were 19. They didn't know any better. Yeah. They had four kids. They were working their butts off, just staying together. So I don't blame them, but they stayed together, not because they wanted to, because they didn't know how to, how to navigate it as well. And so I saw them trapped. That was what it was for me. I saw them trapped, and I was afraid to be trapped because I didn't want to repeat the feeling of them being trapped and feeling miserable a lot mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't want to create that in my life but I didn't know how to stand up for myself. So that was the thing. And she just kept looking at me. It was kind of like a Goodwill hunting moment. She was like, you're not trapped. You're not trapped. You're not trapped. You're a free man. You're a free man. You're a free man. And I don't know what it, it was just like all the months of like the practicing, the integrating, the, the opening it back up, where it's just kind of like this like rush. It like finally connected to me that I am a free man, that I am not trapped. She was like, you can walk away at any moment. You can walk away at any moment. You don't have to keep working in this relationship. Like, especially since you're not married, you don't have to walk, you can walk away at any moment. But even if you are married, you're free. You can walk away. And that was the thing. I was like, I'm so afraid to get married because I don't want to have the shame of getting divorced mm. or the pain that caught that, that happens after divorce that so many people go through. Well, it's so interesting. You were so focused on not feeling trapped that you actually trapped yourself. 100%. And it's so funny because I went to a prison almost every week for four, four and a half years and I watched men who were trapped behind bars. But some of them were emotionally free. Mm. Some of them were there, but I saw them free men. Like they were in a state of complete peace. Not all of them, but some of them had so much love in their hearts, were very kind and generous. They had their families around and they were free emotionally but they just did something that put them in there physically. Hmm. And I realized for so long that I was trapped emotionally, but free physically, and hmm. I didn't know how to break free. And that was the thing where I was like, I'm just sick and tired of feeling this pain. I'm sick and tired of repeating the pattern where yeah. I'm the common denominator in all these relationships, choosing them, staying in them, and not standing up for myself. So that was a massive game changer for me, was investing in emotional coaching showing up consistently when I didn't want to, and doing the work. And I think a lot of us will get business coaches, career coaches, health coaches, but the emotional game is the game that most of us don't know how to master. And yet we, we won't invest in coaching or find support. And I just think it's so crucial. Well, you write at the very end of your fantastic book, The Greatness Mindset. You're talking about unlock the power of your mind and live your best life today. You have a huge section in this on healing. A whole section is healing. I feel like you cannot no, be huge great. huge section. I feel like, like you can't be great unless you heal. of the book yeah. is healing. Like, I feel like it's not even unlock the power of your mind. It's literally unlock the power of your mind, body, and spirit. Well, Integrate every, it all. Well, you know everything's a Trojan horse. So well, uh, that's gotta, true. Bring Nobody's going to pick are... up the healing book. So they're yes, like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exactly. buy the mindset book. But guys, if people understood the art of falling in love with yourself, the world would be a much better place. Mm -hmm.
Lewis, the world is a much better place because you're in it. Thank you, Mel. And I um, wanted to ask you, let's see if I can You're going to make me read one more thing? Or... I am not going to make you read one more thing, especially now that I know uh, I am that, happy that was a trigger read. for you. No, I'm happy to. Give it to me. You I did get the fantastic. Practice. Today, you and I are going to have a conversation about the most important relationship that you have in life, and that's the relationship you have with yourself. I am going to introduce you to a habit that I want you to practice immediately. It is a habit that is based on profound research, and it is a habit that will help you improve the relationship you have with yourself. It will impact your happiness, your sense of control, your confidence. This is the Mac Daddy of all habits. You master this habit, you improve the relationship you have with yourself, and this is like the first domino. You know how in dominoes, when you line them up, there's that one domino that, boom, you knock that sucker over and woohoo, I can't even, all the other dominoes fall. So we are talking about the gateway to creating a positive ripple effect in your life and improving the relationship with yourself. And also it is the secret, this habit, to self-acceptance and self-love. We know we should love ourselves. We should be kind to ourselves. We should accept ourselves. But nobody knows how to do it. And that's what this entire episode is about. I am going to boil the how down to one extraordinarily simple habit backed by a crazy amount of research that we will link to. And my own research study involving 175,000 people from 91 countries who tried this habit for five days in a row. So that means we've got data points that stack up to 175,000 times five. I don't even know what that number is, but it's pretty big. This works. It's high-fiving yourself every morning in the mirror as part of your morning routine. That's it. And I've got the research to prove it. I've got studies to prove it. And what we have found based on our research is that it takes less than five days for you to have an absolutely profound breakthrough in your relationship to yourself by simply adding a high five in the mirror once a morning to your morning routine after you brush your teeth. And at the end of this episode, I want you to stick around because you are going to hear one of the most profound testimonials ever about the impact that one high five made on a woman's life named Chris. Like you're going to need to bring the Kleenex because this is so goosebump, empowering and encouraging and exciting. I'm not kidding. This is profound, profound, profound. And I know that you struggle with self-love because none of us know how to do it. I get questions on this every single freaking day. How do I love myself? I know I need to love myself, Mel. Like this one from Maria. Hi, Mel. This is Maria from Spain. Can you explain how to learn to love yourself? I know I need to love myself as a part of my self-growth, but no one tells you how to do that. I'm curious, is there something I can do about that? I love this question because she's right. We all know we need to love ourselves, but how the hell do you do that when nobody has taught you how? I think the main reason why this concept of self-love is so hard to implement in our lives is because of the definition of love. If you look in the dictionary, love is defined as a feeling, but that's not what it is. Love is an action. And let's just take an example from your life. When you feel loved by somebody else, it's because of how they treat you. It's because of what they say to you. Like for example, when Chris brings me a cup of coffee in the morning, I feel loved because of that action. When he says, I love you, Mel, I feel loved because of the action of speaking those words. But when it comes to loving ourselves, we're sitting around waiting for the feeling, and yet we're not recognizing the truth about love. You feel loved by other people when they demonstrate it through actions. The secret to self-love is demonstrating to yourself, through your own actions toward yourself, that you love yourself. And that's why the simple solution to having a breakthrough in loving yourself, the first domino that needs to fall, is something that I call the high five habit. This is a simple habit that I created that 
boiled down is simply adding a high five in the mirror to yourself, to your morning routine. That's what the high five habit is. Now, one of the reasons why I love this habit is because it has so much research. And the habit's very simple. When you wake up tomorrow morning, get yourself out of bed, go into the bathroom, brush your teeth, and then after you brush your teeth, you're going to put your toothbrush down. And the reason why I want you to do it after you brush your teeth is because I want to use some science called habit stacking. I want this to be part of your morning routine, what you're about to do. And so I want you to do it right after something that you do every morning, brushing your teeth. That way your brain will encode this high five habit even faster. And here comes the most important part. As you put the toothbrush down, you are going to look in the mirror. This is the hardest part of the high five habit. You're going to look in the mirror and I don't want you to look through the person in the mirror. I want you to realize there's a human being that's standing in the mirror there with you every morning in the bathroom and you have either ignored them or you have looked at all of the things you don't like about that person whether it's the weight that you've put on or it's the bags under your eyes or for me, it's one boob hanging lower than the other boob. You sit there and judge that person or based on our research and studies, 50% of men and women cannot or will not look at themselves in the mirror. And the reason is so freaking sad. It's because they don't like the person they've become or they have so many regrets in life uh, about things that they did or the place that they thought that they would be that they can't and won't look at themselves in the mirror. And if you can't look at yourself in the mirror, let's just stop at that right there because what do you do with somebody you love? What's the action when you see somebody you love? You look them in the eyes. That gaze eye to eye gives you uh, 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 not only dopamine, but the oxytocin that is in your brain. It is powerful. It's an act of love to really make eye contact and hold a gaze with love and compassion behind it. So if you can't do that and you're not doing that, you're every morning demonstrating, not love, you're demonstrating rejection and criticism. And so First step of the high five habit, you are going to put your toothbrush down and you're going to look at yourself in the eye. And it's going to feel weird if you don't normally do this. And the next part of this is very simple. Whenever you feel ready, you're going to raise your hand and you're going to high five the person you see in the mirror. Now, one of two things will happen when you do this. And again, I have so much data on this. I know because we've studied what happens. What's going to happen when you go to high five the mirror is you will either laugh out loud and you'll laugh out loud because it's kind of dorky and funny. That's the first, that's what I did the first time I, I high five myself in the mirror. But you're also laughing because your brain recognizes a high five. And so one of the coolest things about high fiving yourself in the mirror is the science involved. It's called neurobics. You're using research in a field called neurobics, which is when you marry a physical action with a new positive thought you want to create. They've studied this at MIT. They've studied it all over the world. It is the fastest way to create new neuropathways and new thought patterns, to marry physical action like a high five with a new thought. And here's where the high five in the mirror gets really cool. So you're leveraging neurobics, all of this sort of physical activity plus neuroscience. You're also getting the benefit of the release of dopamine. You're also getting the benefit of the fact that your brain and your body knows what a high five is because you've been high fiving people your whole life, right? You've seen high fives in sports on television. You know exactly what a high five is. A high five is something that you give somebody a physical action when you're cheering for them when you're encouraging them. A high five is something that you give to somebody when you're proud of them. Great shot. Good job on that test. And a high five is also something that you give to another human being whenever they need encouragement. So think about like standing on the side of a road race. You don't cross your arms and scowl at people. You high five people and cheer for them because you're trying to say, I see you. I see that this race is hard. Keep going. You got this. 
If you're on a sports team and you blow a play when you come to the huddle, a high five from a coach or a teammate says, shake it off. I believe in you. Now get back in the game. And so what's so cool about this high five habit to yourself in the mirror is that a lifetime of positive programming neurologically already in your brain gets aimed right back at your reflection. And so you are physically demonstrating with this simple habit in less than five seconds every single morning that you, yes, you, you take actions that show that you believe in, you love, and you encourage the person in the mirror. Now, another reason why I love this habit is you don't have to think anything. All of the wiring that is already in your brain and in your nervous system, it does the work for you silently. As I mentioned, there is so much research, and we're going to just put just dozens and dozens and dozens of studies. But I want to also point out that there are two studies that are really important. Um, One of them was done with the MBA, and I'm just going to cut to the chase on this study. They wanted to know if there were any habits that winning teams had that the losing teams in the NBA didn't have in the preseason. And it turned out after crunching all the data, and this has been verified by the Wall Street Journal too, beyond the study that these scientists did, that the top four teams in the NBA, in fact, do have a habit in the preseason that the losing teams do not. You want to know what that habit is? You guessed it. They have more high fives, fist bumps, pats on the back in the preseason among team members than any of the other teams. Why? Well, because a high five isn't just an action and a physical gesture that means nothing. A high five actually says, I am with you. It builds trust. It builds partnership. It builds belief. And you can build that back in yourself by adding the high five in the mirror every single morning um, as part of your morning routine. There was another study done with kids where they made a bunch of kids take these math tests and these researchers wanted to know what's the best way to encourage someone through a challenging moment. And they found that it wasn't words of encouragement, like, hey, you're a great student. It wasn't the growth mindset words, like, hey, really admire how hard you're working. You want to know the single best way to motivate kids to do something challenging? It's to say nothing and to give them a high five. This was so profound that the researchers, and we'll link to this study, changed the name of the study to include the surprising power of a high five, the surprising motivational power of a high five. That's how exciting this is. And I think you can hear this because I stumbled onto this by mistake. I started high-fiving myself right after I had gotten fired, basically, from hosting my own talk show. And I needed to give myself like a pick-me-up. And I just instinctually one morning raised my hand and high-fived the mirror. And the immediate effect that I felt of the dopamine in my mind and the boost in my mood and this sense of, okay, I got it. I can do this. I can face this. Having my own back, demonstrating it to myself during a really low moment, it was the beginning, that first domino that fell of an entirely new relationship with myself. It's what led me to get into intensive therapy and to start getting serious about my happiness. And I think you know, everything comes back to you and the relationship that you have with yourself. And so we're going to go deep on this because the relationship that you have with yourself is the single most important thing in the world. And in addition to sharing this research and this simple habit with you, I want to unpack some of the things that people experience when they do it because I've had so many questions about this like this one from Teresa. How do I stop beating myself up and forgive myself for my past mistakes? I can't believe how many years you waste beating yourself up for past mistakes. And the reason why we do that is we don't know how to forgive ourselves because we don't know how to accept ourselves. We don't know how to accept the failures, the regrets, the disappointments. We don't know how to accept, we don't know how to love ourselves through it And that's where, honest to God, this simple habit of demonstrating it every morning in the mirror as part of your morning routine changes everything. And we got to take a short break for our sponsors, but don't you dare go anywhere because I have so much to share with you and I'm going to invite my husband, Chris, to come and join us. Because when I first shared 
this high five habit thing that I had discovered a couple of years ago with him when I first stumbled into doing it for myself. He <laughs> thought it was the stupidest thing he had ever heard. And of course, because I'm relentless and annoying, I was like, but you got to do it for five days. You got to try it. You got to try. And what happened when he tried it for five days was both life-changing, profound, and it was heartbreaking for me to hear as a spouse just how much my husband was struggling and how the simple assignment of looking yourself in the eyes was impossible for him to do at that time. Today, we're going to focus on the components of a million-dollar morning routine, and these are all based on research. And the thing I want you to think about is this. I really believe in something called behavioral activation therapy. And said very simply, behavioral activation therapy is the concept that if you want to change, if you want to be a better you, just start acting like the person that you want to be in the future right now in your today-to-day -day life. That the actions that you take today are what will turn you into the person that you want to become. And look, I know you have a vision for yourself. There is a version of you that you hold in your heart and in your mind that you see that is a better version of the person than you are right now. The you that has a better, more fulfilling job or career. The you that is truly enjoying a deeper connection in your relationship or marriage. The you that has better eating habits, better physical habits, the you that really is experiencing a better connection to the meaning and purpose in your life. That life that you envision, you're capable of achieving it. You can do the work to make that version of yourself a reality, but it's not going to happen out of thin air. You got to put in the work. And I personally believe that that work begins first thing in the morning that every single morning you can wake up and experience a clean slate. You can wake up and you can create a morning routine. Not that the you right now likes, but the morning routine that the future you needs. And the bottom line is, whether you consider yourself to be a morning person or not, a morning routine is essential. A morning routine is like the first domino. Let's just agree that every single day of your life, you wake up and you have the opportunity to create a new experience in your life. And that first series of decisions that you make, which are basically your morning routine, it's like the beginning domino that falls. And if your morning routine sucks, like my morning routine used to suck, the first domino that falls in your day is procrastination, stress, anxiety, depression, suckiness. And that tends to trigger a whole lot more of that. Now, let's talk about the other option. Have you ever had a morning where you rolled out of bed because you had to be somewhere? You actually met a friend at the gym and the exercise class was not only not that bad, it was kind of fun. And you felt really energized and proud of yourself for going. And you were set up for the meeting that you had. You were prepared. What's it like when that domino falls? It feels good, doesn't it? It makes you feel confident and alive and proud of yourself. It kind of creates this energy and this motion in your life. And that brings me to a simple statement. The solution to almost all the problems in your life is your morning routine. If you were to get serious about creating a morning routine that makes you feel like a million bucks, that sets you up with the structure and momentum and positive choices that act like a domino, that send you into your day feeling like you have started the day off with a bang, checking the right boxes, getting it done, feeling proud, putting yourself first, Imagine how the rest of your day flows. You see, how you set your day up is how it ends up. I'll say it again. How you set your day up is how it ends up. 
And if you are serious about making more money or making change stick or getting things done or just feeling happier or finally learning how to put yourself on the list, let's get laser focused on your morning routine. Because when you get laser focused on your morning routine and setting yourself up for success from the get-go, it's pretty amazing what flows from there. And so before we get into the components of my million dollar morning, I want to tell you about the old Mel. And for those of you that listened to the episode that we did about how to create an evening routine that truly sets you up for success in the morning, you have heard part of this, but the old Mel was a complete flipping disaster. I don't even recognize the sad sack of a human being that I used to be. I was addicted to my excuses. I was addicted to my alcohol at night. I was addicted to feeling miserable and to complaining about my problems. In fact, you want to know the first decision I made every single day for years, decades, in fact, the very first decision that the old Mel Robbins used to make. I'd hit the snooze button. Now let's just stop and unpack that, okay? You wake up, the alarm goes off, the sun is out. You have a brand new day in front of you. There are people around the world that died in the middle of their sleep last night. They didn't get another day, but you, my friend, you got another day. And instead of waking up, getting up, making the most of the next 24 hours of your life, you know what the old Mel Robbins used to do? <clears throat> Hitting the snooze button is procrastination in its biggest form. But you're not procrastinating on a paper. You're not procrastinating on a project. You're not procrastinating on a call or a chore. You're procrastinating on your fucking life. You're basically going, the first decision I'm going to make today in this miraculous thing called life is to not do it. I'm just going to avoid it altogether. I have the option to make the most of this time. I have the option to put myself first. I have the option to move my body, to practice mindfulness, to go outside and listen to the birds. But you know what I think I'm going to do? I think I'm going to procrastinate. I think I'm going to avoid it. I think I'm going to roll over. I think I'm going to just opt out. And for me, I can now see that since the first decision I made was to avoid doing what I needed to do, it's so fucking obvious why I was a chronic procrastinator, because I began every day like that. And as you hit the snooze button and you avoid facing your life and you avoid facing the day, you're not feeling confident. You're not feeling energized. You're not feeling in control and empowered. You are basically embodying your excuses, your fears, your anxiety, your frustration, your fatigue. It all begins with the decision you make first thing in the morning. I believe that. And the reason why I'm being overly dramatic about this is because one of my biggest problems in life is that I avoided the hard stuff. I had a million reasons why I couldn't fix things or get a new job or pay off my bills or why I couldn't make things better or why my husband was to blame. And so if you're sick of your excuses, if you're sick of snoozing on your dreams, if you are sick and tired of letting procrastination and doubt and overthinking and anxiety run your life, let's talk about your fucking morning routine. Because let me tell you what the life of a chronic snooze button person looks like. It begins in the morning. You hit the snooze button four or five times. That was me. I'd stare at the ceiling, think about my problem, snooze, snooze, snooze. And the rest of the day, guess what else I was doing? Snooze, snooze, snooze on the problems avoiding the phone call I needed to make. That's hitting the snooze button on that. Avoiding the networking I needed to do. That's hitting the snooze button there. Avoiding the hard conversation I needed to have. That's hitting the snooze button there. Blowing off the gym, another snooze button. It's not just about how you wake up. It's how you wake up, how you set up the day, 
that's how it ends up. The snooze button, that is just one example of the series of disastrous choices I would make for myself. Whether it was hitting the snooze button five or six times, waking up late, not giving myself enough time, skipping breakfast, never having time to exercise, never being organized about anything. It was just honestly a nightmare. And I always say you are one decision away from a different life. And one of the things that has changed my life is deciding that I didn't want to do that anymore. That hitting the snooze button every single morning was not going to help me change my life. So when I finally got serious about first getting out of bed, and then secondly, creating a small series of promises that I make and keep to myself every single morning, it was a game changer. One of the topics that I had, I just have to talk about this today because I'm feeling it is overwhelm. I am feeling so overwhelmed today because I have to pack. I have to get in the car when I'm done talking to you about overwhelm. I have to drive to Boston. I am going to a funeral for a friend and I'm giving a eulogy, which is both a huge honor and a massive massive reason to feel overwhelmed. And so it is kind of one of those life imitates art moments right now where we were planning on talking about overwhelm and I roll in here behind the microphone. I am a hot mess right now. I didn't even put on underwear yet today. I've got on ripped jeans, a jog bra, and a yellow t-shirt. And I just realized that the t-shirt says mentally elsewhere. And so it may feel a little odd that the person that you're going to have a conversation with about overwhelm is uh, a hot mess with a messy bun. And, um, but you know what? I've always envisioned the Mel Robbins podcast to be like taking a walk with a really good friend. And when you take a walk with a really good friend, you show up as you are. And you walk and you talk and you sort things out together. And so today's episode I'm really excited for because you and I are going on a walk together. And I've got five other listeners that are going to join that walk with us. And as we walk and we talk, we are going to unpack this topic of overwhelm. And I've got this framework that you're going to love. There are two types of overwhelm. And seeing which type of overwhelm that you're in, it's going to help you take the steps to deal with being overwhelmed, to become calmer, to tap into your power. You probably notice that my voice is starting to gain a little bit of steadiness. That's because I know what's coming. I know that as you and I talk through these frameworks and as I hear other listeners like you sharing what's going on in their life and why they're overwhelmed, and as we talk about what you can do to face those situations in life, I'm starting to feel a little steadier. Because I know by the end of a good walk with friends, you always feel better. And I want you to stay until the end. Because at the very end, you're going to hear from a listener named Michelle. And she has so much joy in her voice because she has applied what you're about to learn and what I'm about to remind myself of when it comes to overwhelm. So let's dig into our first question, which comes from a listener named Laura. Hi, Mel. This is Laura, and here's my question. Uh, how can I identify when can I push harder and when to pause or give myself some grace? How can I adapt all the things I'm learning in your podcast to my reality? And I can explain. I'm a 35-year-old mom of a very, very active two-year-old. I have a full-time job. And I'm planning on doing a lot of things, including training for my third marathon. But I also suffer from anxiety and I have the habit of procrastinating. I listen to all of your podcasts. I love them and everything makes a lot of sense to me. And I really want to do all the things that you, that you teach us to become the best version of myself. But the truth is that almost every day, life happens, and I end up doing nothing, 
Like, I wake up, I make breakfast, get my kid ready for school, uh, get myself ready for work, and I'm off to work by 8.30 a.m., and then I have a full time of work, and I finish work around 5.30 p.m., then I get home, and I try to be with my kid. At 7.30, we start our, our night routine, and by 8.30, when my baby boy hopefully is asleep, um, I feel exhausted. I only want to have dinner and go to bed. But I also want to fit in a morning routine, exercise, time to work in the thousand things I have in my to-do list, social life, and the list of things that I want to do in one day goes on and on and on, including meditating, cooking better food. It goes on. How can I prioritize and adapt a million dollar morning routine to my reality. Should I expect more from myself? Should I push harder, maybe at night, wake up earlier? Or should I just like feel, do what I can? How do you fit in time to do all the personal growth when it really feels I do not have the time and physical or mental energy to do it? Thank you very much, Mel. Oh my gosh, Laura, I'm so glad you're on the walk today because hearing you list off all the things you need to do, I suddenly feel less overwhelmed. I mean, can we just have a laugh about that? that? That when somebody else is more overwhelmed than you, you're like, oh, okay, thank God, it's not just me. So one of the things I want to say um, to you, Laura, and to you listening is that life is a marathon, not a sprint. There are times in your life where it's going to be overwhelming all the time. And one of those times is when you have kids that are not yet in a full school day. I remember those chaotic days of trying to get our kids out the door in the car to daycare so I could get to a full-time job, commute in, work all day, commute back out, make it back to daycare in time before daycare closed and they started to fine you and you feel like the world's worst parent because you're showing up when the lights are off and your kid there is there alone and then get home and then transition and then get them into the, like it is exhausting. And one of the big lies that we tell ourselves when it comes to overwhelm is we tell ourselves, if I just hurry, I can fit more in. And right now your life is not about fitting more in. It's about a level of acceptance for where you are. Because I hear in what you're talking about this resistance that you don't have enough time, that you can't fit it all in. And the truth is you're doing the most important thing in the world right now. You are taking care of a small child. You are working. You are taking care of yourself. And that is what you need to focus on. And you listening, you might not have a little kid at home anymore or at all, but maybe you're taking care of aging parents. That was my friend Joni. Joni was the primary caregiver for her mother for the last two years as she was slowly dying and suffering from dementia. I never saw Joni. Why? Because she was in a very draining situation where she was caring for somebody with a chronic illness and all she could do was get up, do that, take care of herself, go to sleep. And that brings me to this framework for overwhelm that has profoundly helped me. And as I explain this to you, I not only want you to listen, but as we continue this conversation and this metaphorical walk together, I want you to start to take this framework, the two types of overwhelm, and not only apply it to your life, but see if you can apply it to the situations you're going to hear other listeners describe. Because the two types of overwhelm are legitimate overwhelm. So your life circumstances demand overwhelm from you. And Laura, with a full-time job and a kid under two, and I can't tell if she was married or not, so I'm going to assume she's a single parent, she is in a period of life where she is in legitimate overwhelm. Joni, my friend who was caring for her mom, who just recently passed away, she was in a two- to three-year period of legitimate overwhelm. The demands of her life created overwhelm. 
our daughter, who's about to graduate from college and who is a singer-songwriter, and there's not a defined career path, she right now is careening into a couple months of legitimate overwhelm because of college ending and an uncertain future. And I right now am in a state of legitimate overwhelm. I have a friend who recently died. I am delivering a eulogy. I'm going to be in this legitimate overwhelm until I get through this service. And so when it comes to legitimate overwhelm, the only thing that you can do is to have tools that I'm going to unpack in just a minute. So that's the first type of overwhelm. Now let me explain the second one. And the second one is where most of us live. The second type of overwhelm is lifestyle overwhelm. <laughs> that's when your whole life feels overwhelming. When you're just so used to feeling overwhelmed and busy and to-do lists everywhere and stuff is a mess and things are on the counter and you've overcommitted yourself and you can never say no and you're always last on your list and you don't know how to get out of it because it's become a vicious cycle, your whole life is overwhelm. That's the second type of overwhelm. And so, Laura, you have legitimate overwhelm, which means you need a strategy to ratchet down the stress that you're putting on yourself. And one of the most important things that you can do in terms of a strategy is you have to tell yourself, this is a temporary period of my life. And what I need to do as a strategy is I need to prioritize my own well being, my own stamina. Because remember, this period of your life isn't the sprint, it's a marathon. And so one of the most important strategies that you need is you need to get more rest. That's it. Instead of piling things on, instead of adding more to your life, you need to get more rest. If it's available to you and you can get help, whether it's from your partner or your parents or maybe other moms in your mom group or that you know that have kids the same age, maybe you can swap time on the weekends so you can get time alone to do something like going to a yoga class or doing something for yourself. But your tool right now is ratchet down the pressure and stress. Remind yourself that this is a temporary period of your life where you are legitimately going to feel overwhelmed and it will pass. And with regard to your question about the morning routine, the million dollar morning routine, which by the way, is something I explained in our episode about morning routines. And I will link to that episode uh, in the show notes for you. But my million dollar morning routine, which is grounded in science and helps me feel like a million bucks and gives my days structure, it's 20 to 30 minutes long tops. I don't care how overwhelmed you are, you can fit it in. You get up when the alarm rings, you make the bed, you high five the mirror, you pull on your exercise clothes, you get outside and get a little bright light, and that could even mean sticking your head out of a window if you can't leave your two-year-old, but you could take your two-year-old on a walk, and you spend 10 to 20 minutes moving your body. And you can do that in front of your laptop by streaming a workout. You do those things every 20 minutes, and you will feel less stressed, you will feel less overwhelmed, and you will feel less resentment and pressure to fit it all in. So again, if you identify with Laura or with me or with my friend Joni and your life is in a stretch on this marathon that requires stamina and you have a legitimate reason to be overwhelmed because of life circumstances, cut yourself some slack, know that this will not be forever and focus on the strategy of protecting your stamina and doing simple things that help you with your well-being. The million dollar morning routine, 20 minutes is all you need, is one of those things. I want you to know that when you have the revelation that the voice that you've listened to for years, the voice that's held you back, that made you feel like shit, that it's actually not even yours, that can make your heart seize for a minute. It's kind of one of those like, wait, wait, what? And then when I add on top of it that you're not to blame 
for the crap that somebody programmed into your head. You were just a little person with three pounds of macaroni that was trying to absorb everything around it. And our brains love patterns and it picks up on patterns of speaking. And that's what your brain did. And so if you're having this revelation, holy shit, I've thought that everything's my fault for my entire life because somebody made me believe it was. And then I held on to that belief. Don't freak out. This is great news because so many people spend their entire lives not even realizing that it's possible to change the way you think. It is possible to put a new playlist in your mind. It is possible to filter the world completely differently and to make your brain work for you. Now, are you going to have positive thoughts all day long? No. Are you going to be like, you know, a thousand percent confident? No. But can you stop torturing yourself? Yes. Can you start encouraging yourself? You better believe you can. Can you separate what your narcissistic piece of shit ex-spouse said to you from what you actually believe about yourself? That you want to believe about yourself? Yeah, you can. Can you do it overnight? No. You're going to have to work at this, just like the people in your past worked over time at saying things to you that beat you down. This stuff takes hold over time. But the good news is your brain is super responsive. And when you combine what you're learning about resetting your mind with healing your nervous system and the science of making and sticking to new habits, all of which you are absolutely smart enough and capable enough to apply to your life because your friend Mel Robbins, I am not going to make this scientific. I'm going to give you the science so that you know this stuff works and you can count on it and trust it. But I make this stuff so dead simple that literally your kids and I can do it. And so you can do everything that you are learning on the Mel Robbins podcast. You can change your mind. You can kick the bully out of your head. You can program in new thoughts. You can actively work to change the reticular activity system in your brain, that network of neurons that filters the world. You can take better care of your brain. And taking care of your physical brain will also help the thoughts in your mind. You can develop new healthy habits using the three simple aspects of a habit based in science and focusing on triggers and rewards. And you can do this. You can make it easier. And you can heal your nervous system, which is the trifecta of transformation. We hit the habits, the mindset, and the nervous system. Holy shit, you're like the terminator of transformation. You could do anything. I, I believe that. I just have way too much evidence to the otherwise. And if you're cynical about that, take a look at who, who taught you to be cynical. Just because life hasn't worked out for you the way that you wanted to up until this point, who fucking says it's not going to work out for you and the best days aren't ahead? I'll tell you who says you do. You decide whether or not you're going to continue to let all this crap you're not responsible for to hold you back or you're going to take responsibility for what happens next. Heal your nervous system. You can do that and you don't have to spend a dollar. Change your mind. You can do that, and you don't have to spend a dollar to do it. Make new habits, habits that actually help you get what you want, what you deserve. You can do that, and you do not have to spend money to do it. I <laughs> got that my sister is very kind. No jokes. No jokes. I'm not. I'm being serious. No, I want you to talk about you. Okay. You have to just go for it, and... Um, Here's the thing. And not focus so much on what you're afraid of and being comfortable, but just do the thing that scares you. Which It's even bigger than that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So if you wish to be happier, do you know what life gives you? Things that make you sad. <laughs> and then you have to figure out how to be sad or happy when things are sad. You know what happens when you say that you want peace in your life? You want things to be easier? <laughs> oh, you know what bubbles to the surface? All the stuff that's broken. <laughs> and then you have to bring and figure out how to bring peace to this. And so for you, there is something that you needed to do in Florida. Yeah. So you would get serious about doing the work back here. And that there was something in the breakdown and whatever it is that you want to call it that was meant for you because you clearly needed it <laughs> to come back here and actually do what you're meant to do. And look, it might take 30 years, but it'll be the best damn Netflix special I have ever seen in my entire life. One of the things that I'll never forget is that when I started arguing for her dreams, that's when she got really emotional. You probably heard her choking up when I said, you're moving back and you're going for it and it's gonna be the next best damn Netflix special you've ever had. It may take 30 years. And that's what's available to you too. Because the bottom line is, don't you dare listen to this and spend your time writing to me or DMing me about your excuses, about how old you are or how late you are or how much you've screwed up your life. Do you understand you are listening to a 54-year-old woman who had been thinking about launching a podcast since 2011? And I'm just four weeks into this. If I can reinvent my life and clear out the bullshit that I am doing to argue against my dreams, if I can get in touch with what is truly calling me and claim it and be honest and turn toward it and figure out how to make it a reality, so can you. And the fact is, absolutely everything that has sucked about your life or where you are right now, you needed because you needed to experience unhappiness to realize, I want to be happy. You needed to feel small to realize that's not what's meant for you. You know, I thought that I was going to be a daytime talk show host. I thought that was my big dream. I would like follow the giants like Ellen and Oprah and all these incredible people. And you know what happened? I did that job at CBS Broadcast Center with Sony Pictures for a year, and then I got fired from that job when COVID hit. Literally. And I was lost. And you know what I learned from that experience? I learned that that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't actually like it at all. I loved the people. I loved the machine. I did not like the product at all. There was something that was off. Every single thing that is happening to you is happening for those dreams of yours. And see, maybe you needed the breakdown that you're in in order to realize you deserve to be happy. Maybe you needed that job you didn't like to realize you better get serious about creating what you want. Maybe you needed to apply to law school and get there and go, not for me, to realize something else was meant for you and you should stop denying the fact that you wanted to go into a creative field. So do not let the fact that you have spent a certain amount of time or you're a certain age or you're too early or you're too late or all of that crap to invalidate the truth. The truth is you're right on time. If you're having the wake-up call that I intend for you to have as you listen to this, as you're realizing that your dreams are as alive as they have ever been, if you are starting to go, oh my God, I've been against myself, I'm going to be for myself. If you're starting to say, wow, I really have put the lid on. I really have stopped allowing myself or giving myself permission to have something incredible happen in my life. If you're having the wake-up call that I intended, good. Now let me tell you something else. There is no deadline on your dreams. 
And there is no age at which you're supposed to do this. You can start a business at 18. You can quit the job you had out of college at 24. You can go back to technical school after getting a master's at 31. You can literally adopt a child at the age of 39 when you're single. You can go to nursing school after you've raised your kids and you're 42 years old. You can learn how to teach your first online course at the age of 48. You could become a podcast host at the age of 54. You could get married for the first time at 63. You could skydive at 71. You could run your first marathon at 82. Your dreams do not disappear. There is no age at when you can't do something or when you're too early. It's complete bullshit. Your dreams are something you were born with. They are your responsibility and they are also the life force inside of you. So stop running away from them and turn toward them. Run toward your dreams. Stop arguing against them and be the loudest voice for them. And for crying out loud, stop extinguishing that flame that's burning inside you. Enough with the excuses. Enough with the jokes and the downplaying. Enough with this fear. Your job is to turn toward that flame. Turn toward that flame and freaking fan it. Fan it with all your might. That flame inside you is supposed to burn bright. And the only way that that's going to happen is when you are honest with yourself about that thing you've been denying, about that calling that you feel, about the fact that you're meant for more than where you're at right now, that you deserve to be happy, that those dreams are real. And you have within you the ability to chip away at them. And that when you wake up every single day and you write down those five dreams and you see and you hear and you feel the fact that your life has clues, your life is trying to help you. Your life is trying to help you become who you're destined to become. I want you to know something. You're going to wake up happier every day. You're going to wake up feeling more alive and more self-expressed and more connected and energized when you wake up for your dreams. And I also want you to know that your friend Mel Robbins, I'm going to be right here beside you. I'm going to be here every single step of the way because I see you. I believe in you. I believe in your dreams and I believe in your ability to make them come true. And so that's why I'm here. And I just feel as we, whatever season of your life that you're in, whenever you hear this episode, this is when you're meant to hear this. There are no mistakes. And those dreams of yours are no joke. They are serious business. And they're your responsibility. So five, four, three, two, one. Stop fucking arguing and joking and making excuses and get your ass out there and fan the flame and start working on them. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.